Right, Tom Malone, a very good morning to you. Hi, Owen, how are you? Good. Oh, you've upgraded. Do you, do you have a suit for every day of uh, Royal Ascot, or is, uh, I presume this is a different one from last week? It looks like a different jacket. Yeah, no, it's a different jacket, yeah. different tie, Good different stuff. pocket square. Uh, yeah, I figured, you know, I've started this. I'm kind of committed to it now, haven't I? I mean, I think it would look kind of ridiculous. I don't know which is, looks more ridiculous. So sitting here on your own in your house in the morning in a full suit or just dressed normally to talk about Royal Ascot when we can't go. And did the top hat come out at all yesterday? Uh, I don't see, I don't have a top oh, hat, yeah. but I have, I did get quite a few uh, questions of where it is. So uh, the, the quest is to source a top hat by the end of the week. Very good. Well, we look forward to Friday's OTB AM. We're setting that as a deadline <laughs> for Just top hat Tom Malone. Uh, talk, yeah. talk to us uh, about Batash yesterday, Tom. We, we said yesterday that uh, the, the jockey Crowley had said that if Batash manages to run uh, at an absolute A game, nobody is going to beat the horse. Is that basically what happened? Uh, I'm not even sure he kind of had to be at his right. A game, to be honest. As, as the, He just set the most incredible um, speed fractions throughout the race. He's just, I mean, even Jim Crowley didn't, was very much a passenger, not the driver, really. When okay. you look uh, throughout the race, he, was, uh, he, he had his feet forward, as, as Jason Weaver said. He had his feet in the dashboard and was just holding on for dear life. And that, sorry, there's a complete row. Can you see that row going on behind me? The two dogs are going absolutely... We, we can, we can, we've got a kind of an audio feed going on there with, with a tail <laughs> yeah, they, wagging They're just the over my shoulder, yeah. Oh, wait, there we uh, go. That is exciting. They're actually killing each other. <laughs> Who needs the Premier League back when you've got uh, Tom Malone's dogs fighting in the background? Yeah, uh, so, no, Patash is absolutely unbelievable. Nothing could go with him in the early stage, and then nothing could get close to him. Uh, I was happy with Equilateral, who we suggested at 12 to 1 was an each-way pokey. finished second, the stable mate, but... It was all about Patash, and like I said, his uh, the fractions he set were just phenomenal. And no matter what Jim Crowley says, he had very little to do with the situation because, like I said, he, he didn't even seem to be in control. The horse was going so fast. For, for the uninitiated and uh, the uninformed like us, uh, how can you tell that Patash is the horse of a lifetime, as it's mentioned here? And how big is the ceiling? And and how special is this horse? Um, well, like like I said, like I said yesterday. Ascot wouldn't be his ideal track because he's so quick. I mean, Ascot as a track would generally favour horses with a little bit more stamina in this side. Um, but this horse is just the most phenomenal natural speed. The going yesterday was on the soft side of good, all the jockeys reported. It was officially good to soft in places and he still managed to run, I think, the fifth quickest Kingstand time ever. And you'd consider some of those times would have been on lightning fast ground with slight tailwinds and all sorts of things going in their favour. And you know, despite that. And again, to run a fast race, you need other f fast horses around him. He didn't really have that. Like, he'd hit the bid, who's not the most spectacular, but nothing kind of went up to take him on early. And he just, and like I said, he just went. And there's absolutely nothing kind of Jim Crowley or any of the other horses could do with it. And then by the time Jim Crowley said, all right, just let go of him, uh, that the race was absolutely done. And at the race, in fairness, have a sectional breakdown of the race. And they just... They're, they're kind of colour-coded like a traffic light system and his are just red the whole way throughout right. going that fast. <laughs> like. uh, the, Qu the Queen Anne was the race of the day, though. Yeah, well, brilliant, brilliant. Um, the, the horse we mentioned, you mentioned Terra Bellum and Ryan Moore then on board Circus Maximus. They just got into the brilliant battle in the closing stages and uh, Circus Maximus, you know, they kind of just toughed it out. He's, he's a brilliant horse. He's ludicrously well-bred by Galileo out of America called Duntle, who actually, a funny, it's a, Terabellum's dam and Duntel actually raced against each other, and Duntel came out on top in their own uh, in their own careers. So the the two sons battled it out, and uh, Circus Maximus came out on top. And look, he's he's followed the likes of uh, Frankel and Camford Cliffs in winning those uh, two races back to back as well at Royal Ascot Festivals. The Prince of Wales Stakes today is the big one, Tom. Yeah, uh, looking forward to Adi Ebb. The more rains that falls, the better. Japan is your favourite for Aiden O'Brien. He's actually a full brother to uh, Mogul, who ran deplorably yesterday. But I think Aiden O'Brien gave us a little clue on TV. Uh, he, he was interviewed just before um, Circus Maximus' race, and he was delighted with Circus Maximus because the horse got in his toes. And he said, oh, what about Mogul? And he said, oh, he's just ready to start. And in Aiden O'Brien code, that means not fully fit yet. And in fairness to Mo Mogul, looked huge. So... I wouldn't be surprised if Japan, who is a naturally burly horse, is a little on the undercooked side for today as well. So for that reason, I'll be with Adiyev, who's won over course and distance in the past and uh, loves the rain so often going as well. Probably doesn't get the, the love he deserves, but around about four to one, I think Adiyev's a, a cracking chance. Very good. Uh, any other tips for today, Tom? 
Yeah, looking forward to the uh, rest of the day. It's an intriguing kind of day's racing because it's not, again, it's not the same normal Wednesday. There's only actually the two group races with, you've got like Adiev and the Prince of Wales uh, and then uh, earlier on the card uh, as well. But before that, the first time it's ever been run, the first race of the day, it's a, it's a silver cup, the uh, Royal Hunt Silver Cup. So it's they basically divide the handicap in two and the lesser horses have run in this. And uh, one I quite like in it um, is a horse called Maidani, who's just got the most incredible pedigree. Uh, but again, it's another situation of what's gone on this year because they, they've relaxed rules about handicapping horses. So normally you have to run a horse three times to get a handicap mark. But because of the compacted season, they gave this guy a handicap mark up to two runs. Now, this fella is absolutely... If this fella was, was, a, was a footballer, like he's... he's absolutely the most incredible pedigree uh but he's by a horse called dubawi who costs about a quarter of a million a pop uh per cover and then he's out of attraction he's a classical winner um so this fellow's a gelding he obviously hasn't developed as as they would have hoped but he's nine to two may danny number 17 in the first and uh, like i said he's just he's a horse who's definitely on the up and he's made the most of just the kind of loopholes and rules that are that have been in in play because of the you know um compacted season uh, so he's won in the first. Uh, elsewhere, a horse in the uh, for the first two-year-old race of the um, of the festival as well is the Windsor Castle. So uh, looking forward to seeing how Chief Little Hulk goes for Aidan O'Brien. Uh, but definitely in that one, it would be a horse called uh, the Mighty Gurkha, number eight in your card there. Holly Doyle rides for Archie Watson. Couldn't have been any more impressive on debut, albeit that wasn't the all-weather. So definitely be looking at him and... Uh, a couple of others that I've looked at. I've looked over the Royal Hunt Cup a couple of times. It's a very difficult handicap. And uh, I've written down four horses and then drawn a line through each one of them. So I'm probably just going to leave the uh, leave the uh, the Royal Hunt Cup for the moment. Um, in the 150, I do like a horse called Russian Emperor, though, um, from the Aidan O'Brien Yard. He's a three-to-one shot. Ryan Moore on board. Looks like he'd come on for it. He was beaten by a stable mate the last day in Leopardstown. That was only a few days ago. Um, he's three to one, and that looks uh, a pretty open Hampton Court Stakes. It's the only uh, other, it's the only other um, actual group race on the card after the uh, main event. And the other one I've had a look at is the King George the Fifth Stakes at uh, two twenty-five. A couple of horses in here by Australia, and you may, they, they're they're named by English people. Can you tell? Because they're by a horse called Australia. One's called Convict, and the other's called bodyline so uh healthy bit of casual racism there from the horse naming population but uh bodyline is actually the one i like he's trained by sir mark prescott luke morris on board i uh, was second last time out and like i said looks regally bred and you'd imagine off a mark of uh, you know you'd imagine off a mark of 85 that um sir mark prescott would be able to to do something else with him great stuff Tom, Tom. Can i just ask you about the viewing experience just before we finish yesterday because i watched a bit of the racing yesterday afternoon and i mean it did find it a bit unusual we saw the picture on the front of the racing post today of Frankie doing the dismount and nobody in attendance, aside from kind of Ennis Thyman getting absolutely butchered by the commentators <laughs> in the UK, what was the experience like watching the racing yesterday afternoon? It was very strange, and it was and like everyone kind of couldn't help but comment on how strange it was, which just kind of added to that as well. And you know, like kind of coming back though, but Tash comes back to a mute. Well, of course it's a muted response, but there's no one there. But um, look, it's it's devalued. It's because you know lesser horse, not lesser horses, but fewer horses from in, from abroad are there. And from a viewing experience point of view, it's just bizarre. You know, it's it's like going to a, a kind of like watching the race. And even if you didn't if you didn't know the quality of horse on offer, you'd be mistaken for thinking it's kind of an industry card in mid October. You know, so it's um, it's very very weird. Everyone seems to be doing their best to try and yeah, knock a bit of crack out of it and do what they can. But, uh, yeah, it's very strange. And uh, obviously, you know, horse racing, the first kind of sport in the UK back behind closed doors. So maybe it's kind of going to give a few clues as to what the football will be like in the future and stuff like that. Mm. But, uh, yeah, I mean, so much so much of horse racing, particularly in those final furlong, you know, I can't imagine it's good for a jockey when you sort of get into a, a battle in the final furlong and you don't get that roar of the crowd. Because they are like they are very close to the action, you know. What I mean, the crowd are right down at the rails, and the noise at Royal Ascot or at Cheltenham or anywhere huge like that, where you've got tens of thousands of people. I mean, they really do push them home those last few yards. I mean, the positive for a horse like um, the horse that, that won the um, the Phillies race yesterday, she looks 
like she would have been completely she was actually advantaged by the lesser crowd because she was clearly very hot headed, very light in her toes, and was still a little bit unruly throughout. So you can't imagine how she things would have gone for her had um, had the crowd not been there, had the crowd actually been there. So intriguing to see how it how it pans out over the next couple of weeks. For horses, it's probably a slight advantage. For jockeys, I think it's a disadvantage because even the likes of Frankie de Torre, he just I think one of the photographers just shouted at him, so that's why he did the flying dismount and gave him the picture. But he'd said previously that he wasn't going to because there was no one there to do it for. Uh, how was Ennis Diamond slaughtered on television yesterday? I didn't hear it. I mean, there was about four different versions, uh, Will, but uh, I, I, Anistaman, I think, was the worst. Um, but no one got even close to Ennis Diamond until about an hour after the race when obviously all the presenters got murdered on Twitter. And uh, I think Kevin Blake, even Kevin Blake, by the way, uh, came on, even though he had gotten it wrong himself when he was on, when he covered the horse run the Leopard Stone earlier on in the year. So, um, but but he certainly just, he piled in too, which is great to see. You know, it's great mm. to see everyone just pile into the English <laughs> on Twitter like that. Uh, Tom, good stuff. Enjoy the racing. Chat to you tomorrow. Thanks, guys.